Well, hi everybody, this is Joe. Uh, another day, another seedy motel. But that's okay, because I am here uh, reporting live on location uh, to cover the festivities for International Thomas Covenant the Unbeliever Day. Uh, so you may have noticed in your notifications today a whole bunch of videos surrounding uh, Lord Fowl and Thomas Covenant and Stephen R. Donaldson and stuff like that. Yeah, that's right. It's International Thomas Covenant the Unbeliever Day, which means me and a whole bunch of other people are um, involved in this massive epic fantasy read-along of uh, the first two trilogies of Thomas Covenant the Unbeliever. Um, we're uploading our videos uh, discussing Book 1, Lord Fowl's Bane, and it's not too late for you to join. Uh, so the more people that discuss this series of books, the more fun it will be uh, for me. <laughs> so, And, uh, you know, it's a way to celebrate International Thomas Covenant, the Unbeliever Day. So how can you resist that? So this is an interesting experiment for me today because um, this is a reread. And I am not typically a person who rereads books. Uh, as a matter of fact, the only book that I can think of that I reread, I mean, book meaning novel, the only novel that I can think of that I have reread off the top of my head is uh, Hawaii by James Michener, which I believe I have read four times. Other than that, I really can't think of any other novels that I've read, reread. And so this is an interesting experiment to see what I think of this rereading experience, for one thing. Um, and the other was just to compare notes from when I first read this book. I first read this trilogy uh, I, soon after this edition of Paperback came out with the cover art from the great Daryl K. Sweet. Um, and I think these came out about 78 or 79 uh, so we're, well, let's just call it 40 years ago. I would have been 15 years old. I'm 55 years old now, so I can compare notes, you know, between being a naive young kid who uh, naively told his Pentecostal mother what the plot of uh, Lord Fowl's Bane was. Uh, <laughs> uh, soon after, she, uh, she flipped her lid and uh, banned me from, <laughs> forbade me to read any more of Thomas Covenant, the Unbeliever. You know, I had to stuff these books under my mattress. Uh, I had to hide them from her in order to read these things. <laughs> it was another time, folks. Anyway, I can compare my notes of my naive 15-year-old self with my, and now my, I'm rereading this as a crusty old, you know, cynical, burned-out 55-year-old. And, you know, how does it compare? It's an interesting experiment. Uh, experiment. So let's get into it. Um, uh, initial disclaimer up front, spoils. Uh, I'm good, I, I want to have a discussion of this book, which means I'm going to be talking all over the plot. Uh, if that bothers you, that's fine. You can go watch another video. I don't mind. Uh, so with that warning aside, uh, when I initially read the series of books, um, as, as I said, all my nerd friends read, these were very popular 40 years ago. And all my nerd friends read these things. And at the time, the gold standard of fantasy fiction was obviously The Lord of the Rings. And we all read that thing. It was the Bible to us. And, you know, all the other fantasy writers back then that were that were putting stuff out, you know, Le Guin, Silverberg, uh, uh, McCaffrey, people like that. I mean, that stuff was okay. Um, it, was, it was nothing wrong. It was inter entertaining stuff. But nothing could beat Tolkien. And then Stephen R. Donaldson writes this trilogy, and we all agreed, all my friends and I agreed, this series of books blew The Lord of the Rings out of the water. This was far more sophisticated, at least in our minds. What it lacked in epic scope of The Lord, the Lord of the Rings had that epic scope that just cannot be surpassed. But what this series of books has is characterization and an anchor in reality, in our real world. And I think that is what made it so powerful for me when I was a teenager. Um, it's as it obviously has a lot of inspiration from Tolkien, 
uh, you've got a lot of parallels, a lot of characters. You know, you've got goblin type creatures. You have a, a, a giant who resembles a, an ent, you know, from the Lord of the Rings. You have a evil Lord Fowl who is a, 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 a primeval evil, if I can call it that, from the dim dark past. Who, uh, you know, there's a staff of law by which you can destroy this guy. Um, you know, think, you know, there's a magic gold ring uh, that Thomas Covenant has. There's a lot of parallels that can be drawn with uh, the Lord of the Rings. Uh, so he's obviously inspired by that. But he's also inspired by his father. Uh, Stephen R. Donaldson, our author, um, was the son of a medical missionary who served in India in a leper colony. Uh, and because of that, you know, obviously Thomas or Stephen Donaldson is very inspired by his father's work as a medical missionary in a leper colony. In fact, this book is dedicated to his dedication page to his own father, because the lead character then in this book is a leper. The, our author, Stephen Donaldson, has obviously a lot of experience having grown up in these leper colonies and seeing these people firsthand. Uh, he knows how they live, so he's able to draw that visceral experience that he's very well aware of and put them in his main character. The main character, uh, Thomas Covenant, is a uh, best-selling author who basically blew his wad on his first novel that was wildly successful but ever since can't write anything else. He moves to a farm where his wife works as uh, breaking horses. Can't really ride anything. You know, he's got perpetual rider's block and then from out of nowhere, he discovers that he's got leprosy, which is this weird disease by which your nerves are dead and you can't feel anything, which makes you very susceptible to infection. And it reminds me a lot of these weird cases that I read about of other people who can't feel pain. So they can't feel when they've burned themselves or when they are chewing their tongues into hamburger or, you know, weird stuff like that. With these, these strange, bizarre cases of people who are very prone to infection and who can die from it very easily. Well, that's where the position that Thomas Covenant is in. And so he, part of his therapy is to learn how to be extremely vigilant on his life. He can't afford any dullness in his senses or his faculties because he has got to keep extremely vigilant about any cuts, any scrapes, anything that he cannot feel that will ultimately lead to infection. It could kill him. And uh, this death is not going to be quick either. <laughs> it's going to be really ugly. So he has trained himself to be sharp as a razor when it comes to being critical of his own body. So when he discovers that he has found himself in this dream world, this place called the land, uh, where the earth is magic, it has magical properties, the earth itself is alive with health and fecundity, um, and he is an invader in this land. He, this leprous, you know, injured, ill person in this world of healthy beauty. Um, he must force himself to believe that it is all a delusion. He cannot afford it to be real. Uh, as our author explains, it. Uh, a lot of people understand the feeling of having a nightmare that is too scary and you must wake up because it is too evil to, or, or too scary to be true. But in the, in the case of Thomas Covenant, uh, this, this land that he has woken up in is too beautiful to be, to be true. He must escape it. Um, I'm going to read a small portion that kind of explains uh, his mindset. Um, he, that is Thomas Covenant. This is from page 118 in this edition. He, that is Thomas Covenant, found that his feet were already growing tougher and, ha and his cut hand had healed almost completely. His overt pain was fading, but his nerves were no less alive. He could feel the ends of his socks with his toes, 
could feel the breeze on his fingers. Now the immediacy of these inexplicable sensations began to infuriate him. See, he's in this magical land, and his nerves are growing. Uh, they're growing healthy again. They are regenerating, which in this real world is illogical. Thomas Covenant cannot afford that type of illogical thinking. So he, 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 so he goes on. These were evidence of health, vitality, a wholeness he had spent long, miserable months of his life learning to live without, and they seemed to inundate him with terrifying implications. They seemed to deny the reality of his disease. He goes on, with an effort that made him grind his teeth, he averred, I'm a leper, I'm dreaming, that is a fact. Thomas Covenant could not bear the alternative. If he were dreaming, he might still be able to save his sanity, survive, endure. But if this land were real, actual, then the whole anguish of his leprosy was a dream, and he was mad already, beyond hope. Any belief was better than that, better to struggle for a sanity he could at least recognize than to submit to a health which surpassed all explanation. So he dares not believe that this land that he has found himself in is real. He must convince himself that it is all delusional, that it is all in his head. And that is why he is called the unbeliever. This land that has given him health, regenerated his leprous nerves, drives him stark raving mad. And this leads to the largest point of criticism that people make towards this book. And that is that Thomas Covenant, in a ballsy move by our author, Stephen Donaldson, uh, rapes a young girl of roughly 15 years old in this fantasy world, in this world that he believes is a delusion. He rapes this young woman. Uh, I will refer to this as the incident of page 91 from here on. Uh, early on in this book, early on in this trilogy, our lead character, our protagonist, uh, commits a sexual crime like that. Right off, a lot of people are going to believe. But that, in my opinion, is what gives this book its power. Thomas Covenant is a character who is racked with guilt from here on, not just for the crime of, 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 of rape, not just for the crime of the incident of page 91, but he is racked with guilt for many other reasons. And this drives the whole narrative, this idea of guilt, of, of um, un, un, uh, a guilt that you cannot purge, and he doesn't know how to purge it. And he must convince himself that everything he is experiencing is delusional. Otherwise, he'll go mad. When he, when, he, when he winds up in this land, he meets people that tell him the creation myths and the legends and the stories behind this fantasy world. This includes uh, heroes from the dim, dark past named Barak Halfhand. Uh, whom people believe that Thomas Covenant is a reincarnation of. Thomas Covenant is wearing his gold wedding ring, which is a talisman of power. Wait, it's fireworks outside. That's, they're having a heck of a time here on International Thomas Covenant Day. <laughs> the festivities are crazy. Where was I? Uh, <laughs> um, uh, People see this talisman of power in Thomas Covenant's gold wedding ring. To Thomas Covenant, it's just a damned gold wedding ring. But people see this talisman of power and say, Thomas Covenant, you are our, here. You are our Messiah. You are here, a reincarnated version of this hero, Berek Halfhand, a hero from our past. You have come back to save us. You are, you are our Messiah. And we pay fealty to you because we know you can save us. 
And, and this is too much for poor Thomas Covenant. He, if, even if he does have, have power in his wedding ring, even if this wedding ring does have the power to destroy the arc of time that holds the whole structure of this fantasy universe together, even if this wedding ring that he has has the magical power to ignite you know, the power of a million nuclear bombs, he doesn't know how to use it. He doesn't know how to wield this power. He is no messiah. He is no hero. He's a leper. He's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a pariah. He is unclean. And this drives him even more guilty because people are paying homage to him. They want to serve him. They are, it, 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 it's too much for him. It drives him crazy because he knows that he cannot live up to these expectations that are planted on him by these uh, seemingly very naive people. And speaking of which, this is another difference between Thomas Covenant and the Lord of the Rings in that these, even the people of the land are, more fireworks, even the people of the land uh, in this fantasy world are not noble heroes. None of them really are. It's not like Middle Earth where you have this noble race of elves and dwarves and things like that, and you know, heroes and wizards. You don't have that in this book. What you have is Thomas Covenant arriving in this beautiful, fecund, healthy land that is actually a mere shadow of its former past glory because he hears stories about Again, ancient heroes, Beric Halfhand. He hears stories about Kevin, um, who was forced uh, to uh, save the world by uh, a, a, a magical um, uh, ritual called the, the, the Ritual of Desecration in the attempt to destroy Lord Fowl, this primeval you know, sinister force. But in order to do that, he, he essentially ignites a nuclear bomb and destroys half of the earth and destroys a lot of its power and its magic and its beauty. Um, and he ends up losing these, these amazing talismans of power, like the Staff of Law, these, 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 these relics that hold Hold the structure of the universe together. And so when Thomas Covenant lands in the land, it is a shell of its former glory. The people that he meets are not heroes. When he, when he goes to, meets, to meet the, the lords, the people who hold the lore and the wisdom of this land, there are five lords, and he goes to meet them to uh, dis, you know, discuss this message of doom that has been given him. And when he meets these lords, they're not powerful wizards like Gandalf or anything like that. They're old. They're decrepit. They're inbred. Uh, they're basically powerless. They immediately offer lordship to Thomas Covenant, this bastard rapist from another world. They view him as the Messiah because they are actually powerless. They have no staff of law. The, the staff of law has been uh, discovered by a, by a goblin somewhere, some guy named Drool Rockworm. Um, they, they, the ancient lore of Kevin, uh, there are seven wards of lore that have yet to be discovered. Well, they've only discovered one. At the end of this book, they discover a second. But it's not just a matter of discovering these you know, geocaches of lore. Uh, <laughs> uh, they have to decipher them. They have to interpret this lore. I guess it's like scriptures that you have to piece together and make sense of. They haven't even scratched the surface of doing that. These lords are weak. They don't cast... The only magical spells that they cast with their staves are just to illuminate uh, caves. That's essentially it. They, they really have no power. They, when, when they go to meet this goblin that has the staff of law, they don't bring armies. They have very small armies of blood guard, and they have ailments of maybe a dozen people. 
it, that's it. They don't have vast armies like the Lord of the Rings do. Uh, what are the, these old lords doing, uh, uh, these guardians of ancient lore doing going into battle? They have no choice. They have nobody else. They are allowing Thomas Covenant to lead the charge, this sick man from another world, and they're counting on his wedding ring. And at the end of these books, it's like the Marvel Cinematic Universe. What happens at the end of every one of those movies, the Marvel movies? There's this huge special effects riddled CGI battle, right? In every one of these movies, books, what have you. That, that's what you can expect. And you don't get that in this novel. How do the lords, how do they, how do they rest the, the staff of law from the goblin, uh, drool rockworm. It's not by a crazy magical battle or anything like that. It's not with fireworks that are going off outside my motel room. They literally wrestle <laughs> and wrest the staff out of his hand. That's all they do. Uh, it, they're, they're weak. They're very weak. And that's basically how this novel ends. The novel ends with the lords gaining the staff of... of of law back from Drool Rockworm, who, you know, by the way, resembles a Gollum from the Lord of the Rings. This staff of power that he has found has corrupted him in much the same way as it has Gollum, because he doesn't know how to use this, this, this power. He's just a damned goblin. Uh, you know, another parallel, but. That's how the story ends. The story does not end with the land suddenly resurrecting to its former glory or anything like that. No, the, the novel ends with they gain the staff of law. They've got another ward of uh, Kevin's lore that they haven't solved. And that's basically where it ends. Uh, nothing really has improved other than that they have the staff of law. And a lot of people have been killed, you know. So uh, um, I, I would like to know the publication history of this book. Um, I heard Steve Donahue say that he thought that this was a standalone book, and after it gained some success, Stephen Donaldson wrote a trilogy around this. I find that, that that may be true, but frankly, I find that very hard to believe because this book ends on such, not really a cliffhanger. It's not like it's a suspense, like you're waiting for something to happen at the end, but it's unresolved. There is a lot unresolved in this book because it, it, you feel like you're, it's ending in the middle of a story, which it really is. Uh, we're going to come back next month and discuss the next book in this series, The Ill Earth War. Uh, so I think that's my discussion uh, of Thomas, of, um, of Lord Fowl's Bane. Um, I thought... It was brilliant. Uh, probably after dissecting it more than I would as a teenager, I loved this book. Uh, I, 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 I rate it higher than even I initially did when I was a teenager. And I understand the criticisms of this book. Um, however, I think that the incident of page 91 is not only crucial to driving this character. I, th I, I do think it's necessary. It's what makes this book and this whole story and this character of Thomas Covenant makes it unique. Uh, so there you go. That's my assessment. So great. I'm really looking forward to see what everybody else has to say. And I'll talk to you again next month with the Ill Earth War. Happy International Thomas Covenant Day. Now back to the fireworks.